Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. If you're new here, my name is Jess. I'm so glad you're here. If you're not new here, I'm also glad you're here. Uh, first off, I'm going to apologize for the bovine accompaniment on this video. I've tried to point the camera in the other direction. The guys are currently going to get them a new hay bale. So they're gonna be a little loud here for the next little bit. I can't wait to shoot the video because I gotta get my kids from school. Real life, farm life content creation. I actually just came out to my greenhouse to uh, get a list together and I thought this would be really great information to share. I am currently just a few weeks out from beginning with my seed starting for 2023 and for the garden this year. And today I want to go over the things that I'm making sure I have on hand so that when I'm ready to start seeds I have what I need. Of course you can always just go down to a local store and you know, buy seed starting supplies, but in my opinion, the things that are readily available in the big box stores are not necessarily the best products to use. So I think it does you service to think about this a few weeks in advance. So if you need to order something, you can. So first off, I wanna talk a little bit about seed starting because some of you may be deciding to start your garden from seed for the very first time. It is totally worth it. I'm a huge advocate for gardeners growing from seeds, even if you are a new gardener. While there is merit to going and buying started plants, and I still do buy some started plants that do not grow exclusively from seeds, I think that growing from seeds lowers the investment and in doing that lowers the risk. So if you spend your whole, you know, maybe you have a hundred dollar budget to start your garden and you spend that all on plants and if you make a mistake and they die, then you've lost a much larger investment. Whereas if you start from seed, you're losing a whole lot less money. And if you have a hundred dollar budget, you can get a lot more in your garden with seeds rather than going and buying started plants. So I do have some great blog posts covering this topic as well as what I'm talking about today. So there will be links to that down below if you wanna go uh, save that, bookmark it, uh, explore rootsandrefuge.com. We've put a lot of information there in blog form because I know some people learn better by reading. And Oh good, here comes the hay bill. It's also really nice if, you know, whenever I've got a thousand videos or whatever, to not have to weed back through them to try to find a specific piece of information. Going through blog posts is a little easier. So I have some, some information about how to start seeds. I'm going to be walking you through that process as I start mine. And the reason I'm putting this video up now is because right now is when I'm thinking about, okay, I need to gather my supplies. So you'll get it real time and being in zone eight, I'm probably doing this before quite a few of you this year. Now, if you're unsure when you need to start your seeds, the very first thing that you need to do is go to a search engine and type in estimated last frost date for your zip code or the closest major city. Okay, I gotta show you all this. I know that this isn't gardening related, but come on. Who doesn't love to watch a bunch of cows run across the field? <laughs> oh, and horses. Uh, there's a couple of dogs mixed in there and maybe some alpacas. They're going after the hay bale. They're so happy. All right, back to the topic at hand. The estimated last frost date is going to be based on the past weather records in your region. It is just an estimate. It is not rock solid. The weather doesn't let us know what it's gonna do ahead of time. We just have to gather the information and guess. But you can start your seeds based on that estimated last frost date. So once you have your estimated last frost date, you need to write that down. If you're doing like a notebook or a journal, something that you're planning in, maybe you're doing your planning on your phone or a spreadsheet, uh, your estimated last frost date is like a guaranteed starting point and you're gonna be working back from there. Um, the next thing you need to do is you need to write down what you wanna grow in your garden this year. This video could get very long and very complicated if I tried to talk about all of the details of all of the different things. I did write a really good book that covers this more in depth. I do have a lot of content about this. And as I said, if you just wanna watch along and work along with me, if we have similar last frost dates, or if you wanna work a little bit behind me, keeping in mind, okay, she started this eight weeks before, this six weeks before, this three weeks before, I'll show you as I go what I'm doing. So you don't have to have it all figured out. I like to start my peppers 
and my eggplants about eight weeks before my estimated last frost date. So um, what I'll do is I'll count back and then I'll write that date down there. I'm getting very close to that I'm now where I am, which is why I'm getting my seed starting supplies together. I like to do my tomatoes about six weeks before my estimated last frost date. Uh, the reason why I don't go a lot before that is because that frost date might be wrong. We may come down to the day I'm anticipating getting to plant and look at the 10 day forecast and see that we still have a freeze on the forecast. I like to start my plants in two and a half inch pots or in like cups or something like that. And once they're six to eight weeks old, they're getting kind of big for those. Uh, and so at that point, if I can't put them outside, I've got to figure out what to do with them or they start to suffer. So you don't want to get in a position where you have a bunch of plants that you're having to pot up and store inside um, because you can't plant them out yet. So it really is best to kind of plan around the last frost date based on how quickly things grow. And in my experience, peppers and eggplants do take a little longer to germinate, do, do grow a little bit slower. So I do eight weeks on them, six weeks on the tomatoes. Um, I do also start some flowers and herbs like between four to six weeks before the last frost. So then things like cucumbers, squash, melons, sunflowers, maybe even some other flowers like zinnias and calendula. Uh, borage, a lot of the other things that you grow in the summer garden. I have a very long growing season because my last frost date is in like April and then my estimated for first frost date is like the end of October so I have like a 200 day season. I actually prefer to direct sow those things because in my experience that's easier, it's less work, and for the most part things do really well. If you're gonna start those things in pots um, I would do it like three weeks, maybe four weeks at the most before time to transplant because all of those things grow a little faster and um, certain things like squashes particularly really don't like their roots disturbed. So if you're going to put them in pots, you need to make sure that they're not going to get root bound in there because if something gets root bound and then you have to break it up to transplant it, it can get really fussy. So you can start all of that other stuff, uh, but that's going to be three to four weeks before your last frost date just to make sure that they don't get root bound. And if you live in a place that you have like a whole lot of insect pressure there early in the spring, you may need to start those in pots where you can protect them and move them out. And that's completely okay. But also know that in a lot of places you can direct sow those things with great results. I have started all of that stuff. I've started root vegetables from seed indoors. I think that there can be great reasons to do that with like succession sowing and if you're going to try to maximize your production. But for the sake of this video, I'm mostly talking to the new gardener who is really just getting started in seed starting. And I think that focusing on things that really need to be started ahead of time, just to give you the jump start on the seed, like the tomatoes and the eggplants and the peppers, uh, maybe herbs, some flowers. And then again, the other stuff like three to four weeks, I think that's enough to focus on rather than trying to start absolutely everything from seed. So write down your last frost date, write down what you wanna grow, and then write down how many weeks ahead of time you plan on starting those. Figure out those dates by working back from their last frost date, and now you have your seed starting schedule. It's very simple. It's not black and white. If it's now almost your frost date and you haven't started tomatoes, don't panic. If you have a long enough season, you can still grow them. We start things ahead of time because when the frost has passed, if we can put nice sized plants out in our garden, we're that much closer to getting harvest. And therefore we're extending our season by starting the seeds ahead of time. I've, I've started tomatoes in the middle of the season and put them out and just had tomatoes that I was picking later. It, you haven't missed your opportunity if you don't start your tomato seeds six weeks before your last frost, but I'm saying that's probably the earliest you wanna start them. And if you wanna maximize your season, that's when you wanna do it. I'm coming over here because the sun's in my eyes. Now, today, I do not have my supplies to show you, but I'm going to tell you about them. I'm gonna put pictures up on the screen. Uh, the reason I do not have my supplies is because I'm making my list right now. There are some things I'm gonna have to order. There are some things that I'm having to get out of storage. I'm putting it on my list, and we're currently working on the shelving for the greenhouse. It's being worked on in the barn uh, and being prepared to move out here, so I can't bring all my stuff out into my greenhouse. But I didn't want to wait till I had it because I didn't want you to be behind on getting the information. So the first thing you're going to need to start your garden from seeds, obviously, 
seeds. <laughs> Um, I get asked so many questions about this because of some misunderstanding of information. People are worried that they're gonna like buy bad seeds or buy seeds from the wrong place. Uh, one of the biggest pieces of misinformation is that people are like, oh, I wanna make sure I don't get GMO seeds. GMO seeds are not legal to sell to consumers and while there is an argument that things can be cross-pollinated and all of that stuff, um, you're, you're not gonna go to a place and buy GMO seeds accidentally. If something is labeled non-GMO, it's not because there is other seeds that are GMO that are being sold to consumers. It's simply because seed companies get asked so much, are these seeds non-GMO? They just go ahead and put it on the label. It's like when, I remember once seeing a package of oranges at the store and it said gluten-free on them. And anybody who actually knows what gluten is knows that there are no oranges at the store that have gluten in them. So that was not really necessary to be labeled, but sometimes labeling is not really for the sake of necessity. So you're not gonna buy GMO seeds, so don't worry about that. It is true, I like supporting seed companies that are doing things for the home gardener. I like supporting smaller businesses rather than necessary big conglomerations, but I am a big believer of growing the seeds that you have access to. So if the seeds you have access to are from the dollar store, are from Walmart, are from big box stores, are from your neighbor's shoe box that they have saved from their papaw that saves seeds, from a seed bank, from any store that you go online and buy seeds, grow the seeds you have access to. Now me personally, I do have favorite places to purchase seeds. Um, I just did a real big unboxing video a few weeks ago. I ordered a big seed order from MI Gardener. Um, Luke actually provides a coupon code for my viewers. It's called, it's Jess 10 um, and it gets you 10% off his already really affordable seeds. So that's, that's probably my first go-to place. Um, Botanical Interests is another one, a company that I really like. They provide a solid product. Um, of course, I've been using Baker Creek seeds for a really long time. I love their selection. I like getting uh, tomato seeds from Brad Gates over at Wild Boar Farms. I actually um, just lined up a phone call with Brad and we were talking about offering like a special Roots and Refuge favorites package. So I'm working on something with that in the future with him. Uh, so we should have that information out here really soon. But I have grown all kinds of seeds. I actually order seeds from different companies all the time that I don't necessarily make videos about um, just because I'll see something that I want to try and I'll like check out their customer service, check out their packaging. I, I really love seeds. My seed collection is large. I give away a lot of seeds um, and to me there's nothing that makes me feel quite as, as rich and secure and excited is, as having seeds. It's just there's something about having lots of seeds that makes me feel like I've made it and a wonderful investment and I love to have lots of seats. So uh, those are my favorite. I'll put links down below to those. Again, I have a lot of content about that that you can find by just searching Roots and Refuge and the topic that you wanna search. You do not have to have seeds that are packaged for this year. Um, that's something that people will misunderstand because seed companies are required to put like a sell-by date on their seeds because by law you have to package and sell seeds for that year and the next year you can no longer sell those seeds. Seeds are good for many years. I have seeds that are 10 years old that I am regularly growing in my garden. If you keep them cool and dry, you actually won't lose just a whole lot of germination on them. The germination rate may go down a little bit over time, especially if they're not being kept cool and dry, but I have seen some people growing some really old seeds. And I mean, I still have seeds that I'll come across in my seed collection sometimes. I try to grow from them as much as possible so they don't go bad, uh, but that are several years old that are from the Dollar Tree. A friend of mine picked up a whole bunch of seed packages for like 10 cents each. And there have been plants from those seeds in my garden every year since then, so they still are just fine. And so that's why I also say like, just grow the seeds you have, hang on to them, share them. Sharing the seed love is like one of the greatest parts of gardening because gardeners love to share that. And then eventually you learn to save them and there's never a shortage of seeds again. Also, you probably, if you're getting all of these seeds from seed companies, there is some information on the seed pack and sometimes they'll answer that question of like how many weeks before you should start them. Sometimes it's vague, so you can just go by the general information that you find online. Next, you're gonna need some sort of container 
to put your seeds in. Now, um, I started out using red solo cups, party cups from the store. Um, and we were at the time in youth ministry. And so there were always like parties, like Super Bowl parties and different things like that. And there were always all of these red solo cups. And there was a ton of waste, which I don't love uh, having a lot of plastic waste. So I would gather them up, I would wash them, and then we would stack them in one big stack and run a drill bit through the end to drill a hole in all of them at once. And that's what I used for seed starting for years. Um, they do break down after maybe the second season. I would reuse them, but they start getting really brittle. But I mean, if you're recycling them from a party, you're already giving them a second life by using them once. The downside to using red solo cups is that they're normally, that's like a 12 ounce container. So that is gonna require more soil on the front end, but that's not necessarily that bad. You get really nice, big, healthy plants by giving them that much space. Uh, so I'm still actually really for using the red solo cups, especially if you can reuse them. Now I typically use a two and a half inch pot from Bootstrap Farmer. Um, they make pots, which 32 of them fit in one of their 10 by 20 trays. And I really like them because they last for years. So I have some bootstrap farmer cups that I've been using now for like four seasons. And to me, if I'm gonna use a plastic product, I'd really like to use a plastic product that is long lasting. Other options you can use are um, peat pots, which are the biodegradable ones. These, I, I don't love these for brand new gardeners because maintaining the moisture in those can be kind of difficult. Um, and maintaining moisture is a really big part of the success of seed starting. I typically shy away from those as a suggestion for new gardeners. If I'm going to use peat pots, I use them for those things like melons and squash and cucumbers, things that I'm starting maybe like three to four weeks before my last frost date because that's a lot less time I have to regulate them since I only need them to actually work for me for a few weeks. If they start to break down ahead of time, it's not a big deal. And then you can just peel them off of the soil around your plant and plant those plants without disturbing them. So they have a good purpose for that, but as far as starting all of your seeds in peat pots, I don't really recommend that. There are some other products that are available like the little um, cells that kind of expand. I've played around with those. Um, I've bought them at the store and played with them. I don't hate them, but I just don't think that they're necessarily the best product. And especially for a person who is new, I think just getting like a plastic cup, um, reusing a yogurt container, reusing some sort of container that you can put a hole in the bottom of, it's just gonna be a lot easier to regulate or buying obviously dedicated seed starting pots. Those expandable cells, um, they can dry out really easily. They just seem to be weird on moisture. And then also in my experience, the wrapper around them doesn't really fully break down when you put them in the garden, you have to cut them off. So I don't feel like you're gaining that much as far as like, you're, you're still wasting some sort of non-biodegradable material. You're still having the hassle of having to do that. I just don't think that they offer enough benefit to weigh out over the downsides. Another thing that I have used in the past, which are kind of like these poly type bags, you can buy them on Amazon uh, for really cheap for a whole bunch of them. I have started seeds in those as well. And while I don't think that they're necessarily the bee's knees, I think that it's still waste. That's not paper. It actually has some plastic in it. Uh, when I first bought it, it said biodegradable. I thought it was paper. It's not really truly biodegradable. It doesn't really break down that well, uh, but they're very affordable. And I think that if you can't afford to buy a bunch of pots and maybe you can't even you know, afford to go get cups and fill them up with soil, starting seeds in those little bags, I do think is a more viable option than some of the other cheaper things um, because you can start them. I, I suggest if you do use those bags to fill them with soil and put them in some sort of tray because they're gonna need bottom watering because they, uh, they do dry out really fast. And then when you go to plant them, don't plant those bags, cut them off and plant um, you know, the roots of your plant without that bag because those bags do not break down well enough to plant them in my experience. 
So you need some sort of container. I did mention reusing things. Um, you can reuse any sort. I've seen people do like yogurt cups. Um, I mean, all kinds of little plastic containers, like sour cream containers. You can totally start seeds and stuff like that. Do keep in mind that using a larger container is going to require more soil. And so if you end up using a whole bunch of large containers and having to spend lots more money on soil, you m might have not saved any money by reusing stuff. So, you know, that's a personal choice, but I, I mean, it works well. I've seen some like stuff online where people use like egg cartons and um, toilet paper rolls and newspaper pots and stuff like that. These are viable. You can uh, try to do that. Keep in mind that smaller containers are going to dry out faster. Um, and the natural fibers like a cardboard or paper, it, it, you're just gonna have to be way more mindful that your soil doesn't dry out. You can totally use those things. Do know that anything like a tomato plant or an eggplant or a pepper, once it gets more than about this tall, its root system is going to be substantial. A root system of a plant is way bigger than what you can see above the ground. So if you've started all your tomatoes in like an egg carton, that's not enough space for the roots. You're gonna need at least like this much space. <laughs> this is like super uh, scientific here. But you're gonna need a substantial amount of space for a plant that's actually transplantable. So you could start them in an egg carton, but you're gonna need to move them up before it's time to put them out. And then the last thing is soil blocking. Um, this is something I have done some soil blocking, which is where you buy like a, a special tool that actually compacts soil down and you block them into trays and you can start seeds in them. Um, I like soil blocking. I think it's really good. I start way more plants than I plant because I sell them or give them away. And um, I've not ever exclusively done soil blocking because I need some sort of container to transplant the plants in. So while if you're starting just your seeds for your own personal use, um, definitely look into soil blocking. And that's not something I'm gonna be doing at large because it just doesn't serve my purposes. So next, and this kind of goes along with containers, um, I like to use trays. I'm gonna have to put a picture up on the screen. I keep looking for my stuff to show you. Uh, I like to use bottom watering trays. So anytime I'm starting seeds in containers, I like to put those containers in a tray. Now you don't have to buy specific bottom watering trays. The ones I use are from Bootstrap Farmer. They're 1020 trays. Um, I will link those. And again, that this sort of stuff is a little bit of an investment, but you can reuse it season after season, especially if you're diligent to clean it off and store it not in the sun. It's gonna last a lot longer, but you can expect years of use out of these things if you take care of them. Uh, but you could improvise and try to find some other sort of container that's just gonna hold water. If you're using things like the red Solo cups, what you can do is drill a hole in one cup and then put a marble in a second cup and put the first cup down in it. So you've basically got some sort of reservoir for water. Uh, the reason for this, I like bottom watering um, in trays because I can just pour the water directly into the tray and never have water raining down over my plants, which just helps them stay healthier and alleviate splashback. Um, it forces roots to go deeper when you bottom water because they go down towards the water, which is good. And we want to, we want to encourage strong root systems and lastly I live in a place that gets really hot really fast I'm starting my seeds in a greenhouse and things can start drying out really fast especially when the plants start getting bigger so I like having bottom water as an option because it's a reservoir that um, they can have access to more water when I first start my seeds, I, I don't fill those reservoirs up and leave them. I typically water it a little bit, let them soak it up and give them a chance to kind of let the soil dry out a little bit. Some people will deal with like root rot, fungus gnats and stuff like that if you put too much water from the beginning, but it's a nice option to have when the plants get larger. Next, you're gonna need some sort of medium to go in your container. So you have your seeds, you have your containers, you have maybe a bottom watering option if you're deciding to go that route. Uh, next, you're gonna need some sort of growing medium, which is to say your soil or whatever it is you're using to grow in. There are soilless mediums like um, things that are mixed with peat or cocoa core or whatever. 
Um, I am, I've learned that the way I do this is a little different than what a lot of people suggest. So when you go to the store during seed starting time, you're going to see seed starting mixes. Uh, there are different brands of this. I think Jiffy has a brand and, um, Pro Mix has a brand and they'll say seed starting mixes and sometimes they'll say on the package sterile medium or soilless medium. I don't use those. Um, I don't have anything against them and a lot of people prefer to use them because essentially they're very, very fine. Um, they're very easy to work with texturally. They're very lovely. Uh, the thing is, is they don't have any nutrition in them. So if you start your seedlings in a soilless mix or a seed starting medium that does not have any nutrition in it, it'll say if it has fertilizer in it. Uh, most of the seed starting mixes though don't. Um, those seedlings are gonna come up, they're gonna use all the energy that they have stored in their seed, and then they're gonna stop growing or they're gonna start turning yellow. So if you've ever tried to start seeds before and you're like, I don't know what happened, they just stopped growing. If you were using a seed starting mix, it was likely because they starved to death. The reason why people like using soilless mixes or seed starting mediums is because they are very, very fine. You don't have to sift anything out of them. And being sterile, they don't have any sort of like funguses or whatever in it. They could still actually end up having gnats in them because you know, they've been in warehouses or whatever. I don't, I don't personally see the appeal, me, I'm a little bit of a lazy gardener. I like to cut steps down where I can, but the people who are using those professionally are starting lots of little seedlings in those and then they're potting them up into a potting mix or they are feeding them with some sort of liquid fertilizer in that seed starting mix. So what I like to do, my personal go at things, is I just start things in a potting mix and that's where I start my seeds in. Uh, so my favorite brand of potting mix is called Bacto. I have zero affiliation with this company. And in fact, I noticed that last year, the bags of Bacto I got were not quite on par quality wise with what I've gotten from them in years past. The post COVID gardening rush has changed the quality of a lot of products in gardening because there's just been this massive demand on a limited supply. I am planning on using Bacto again this year. If for some reason I feel like um, the, it's still, it was really chunky is what it was. I had a whole lot of not broken down pieces in it. Um, I just sifted them out and used what was left over. But if I, if I felt like the quality was still lacking, I might look at something else, but I still feel like as far as organic potting mix goes, it's, it's the best I've found where I live in the price point that I'm paying for it. So here I'm paying something like between like 10 and $12 a bag, like the 50 pound bag for Bacto. Um, don't go spend $40 a bag somewhere on Bacto just because I said it was good. I wouldn't spend $40 a bag on it. I would probably try something different. The main thing is, is that you want some sort of medium. I like to do potting mix. You're going to have to sift the big pieces out, but it has nutrition and it has some sort of, you know, fertilizer. It is broken down branches. Therefore it has a lot of nitrogen, different things in it, and it's going to fuel your seedlings. Different regions have different brands. Um, and I've started seeds in a lot of different things. I've started seeds from big name brands that aren't organic. I have started seeds in whatever I could get my hands on at different times. Now I have a place I can buy Bacto by the pallet. I can get a whole lot, start all my seeds in it. That's great. But if that wasn't available to me, I would just find another potting mix and develop a preference. So I'm giving you the freedom, develop preferences, start with one bag of something. If you don't like the texture, it has big clumps in it, or you don't feel like it's broken down, go find another bag of a different brand. I like to use organic because that's important to me. Um, you don't have to. Starting your own seeds in conventional soil is better than not starting your own seeds at all. So, so don't make it super black and white. What you do not want to do to start your seeds is start them in straight compost. It, that can be way too dense. It can be way too hot as far as like too high nitrogen and your seeds are gonna struggle. And I like to suggest that people do not buy bagged garden soil. Uh, potting mix has elements in it to make it lighter 
and more draining um, and it typically does have some sort of fertilizer in it and that is why I like starting seeds in potting mix. Garden soil is often much denser and thicker and a lot of times does not have those elements to help it drain. And so if you start your seeds in garden soil, there's a good chance that that soil could become compact in those cups and then your seedlings may struggle to develop their root system because when they first start out, they have these super fine thread roots that really need a loose mixture to be able to grow freely in. Uh, I have had people argue with me on that before saying that they do start with garden soil. Um, so obviously you can sow seeds in the garden and it can do okay, but um, we're talking about ideal and I, I don't think that garden soil is ideal. If you have already purchased garden soil or compost or something that you feel like is very um, too dense, it feels too dense and thick to you and you wanna lighten it up, you can buy like perlite, um, you can buy cocoa core and mix those in to kind of lighten it up because that's typically what potting mix is. It's soil that has some sort of like compost mix into it as well as something like perlite and cocoa core that's going to lighten it up and let it drain a little easier. Next, so the, the things that you are going to need to start seeds. Uh, we have to consider what seeds need to grow. So you, so you have a draining pot, it's filled with growing medium and you're gonna put your seeds in there, which is great, they need that. But next they're going to need uh, warmth and light. So what keeps a seed from sprouting when it's in the little seed packet is that it is cool and it is dry. Um, if it at any point were to become damp consistently in that seed packet, and given any measure of warmth, it would just sprout right there in that seed packet. Of course, it would shrivel up and die because it wouldn't have what it needed. Seeds will actually fall from plants and lay in the soil over the winter, but they might even have moisture in that situation. But because it's cold, they stay dormant. It is when they are given warmth and moisture that they begin to grow. So as a person who's gonna be starting seeds, you have to consider how you're going to provide the warmth and the moisture to your seeds. Um, obviously, I have a greenhouse, and this is where I start seeds. By closing up the greenhouse and venting it appropriately, I maintain the temperature in here, obviously capturing the sunlight, provides the warmth, and there's plenty of light here for them. If you do not have a situation where you can create warmth and, and light, in something like a greenhouse, you can still start seeds. You just have to do these things artificially. So there are multiple products that you can buy, particularly heat mats and grow lights. Now there, there runs a gamut of costs in what you can invest. And this of course is going to vary widely depending on what it is that you're trying to do. But if you have a small garden and you're just trying to start a handful of seeds, you can get one grow light and set it up somewhere like a garage or if you can keep it warm enough or a basement or a closet. You don't necessarily wanna have like a grow light set up all the time in your living room because it can be damaging to your eyes to have that constantly going. So you kinda wanna keep it in an enclosed space that you can keep it sort of blocked off from people. I've even seen where people have like put them under their table and then covered it with something. So you've got kinda your grow tent under your table. You can get super resourceful here. I have a real big grow light that I like. I've tried lots of them and I've actually found that they all work pretty well. Um, and I've also just done a fluorescent shop light. So like a long shop light. You have to keep your seedlings a little closer to that, but it does work. So you can actually use all number of things for your grow light. I think that buying a specific grow light that has all the different colors of lights in it probably does provide the healthiest light for your plant, but the shop light works really well. And if you're just doing seed starting, so you're talking about six to eight weeks of use, it's probably just as fine. Like a lot of times you get on, you see those super expensive grow lights. That's for people who are growing things under those lights, like fully. They're growing plants their whole life underneath those lights. It's not necessarily for seed starting that all of those different gamuts of color matter quite as much. So you can kind of get away with a lot of different things for seed starting because you really just are getting these plants going then you're gonna harden them off and move them outside where they're gonna get 
the sun for most of their life and into producing. So you don't really have to worry about it quite as much. That's really gonna be more determined by your budget. So if you wanna buy a really great grow light, that's awesome. But if you wanna get by with a shop light, you could also do that. As far as heat mats go, um, those aren't always necessary. Typically the ambient temperature of a house is warm enough for seeds to grow. Um, so, I mean, if you're keeping your house at about 70 degrees um, Fahrenheit, which is like, what, 23 Celsius, I think, um, that's, that's fine. Like, seeds will grow in that temperature. Uh, they're gonna grow faster and they're gonna germinate faster with heat. Uh, so what a lot of people like to do is they'll put like their seeds and they'll put them up on top of their refrigerator somewhere where it's gonna be warm and as soon as they pop up, they take them and put them underneath the grow light. Um, I like heat mats, especially for germinating things like peppers. And sometimes I'll even plug heat mats up in my greenhouse because it does get a little cooler in the evening. It's not always 70 degrees in the greenhouse. And then that way I can get them germinated, but then I take them off after germination. They don't need those to stay warm after the fact. That's really just for heating your soil up. So I will also put a link to uh, some heat mats or something like that, but no, like I've seen people get on and ask like on Facebook groups, they're like, which one should I get? Light or heat? I can only afford one. Well, light. Um, your plants aren't gonna, they're not gonna thrive without light, but they'll just grow slower without heat. So you are gonna need something to water your seedlings. Um, this is not something I've ever bought anything specific for. Obviously, uh, whenever I've got a whole lot of seedlings going out in the greenhouse, I like the bottom water trays and I take a sprayer on a hose and just put them directly in that and fill it up. Um, if you are doing these things in the house, of course, you'll need some sort of tray underneath your pot so that they're not draining out onto your carpet. Uh, but what I, I've always just used in my house is like water bottles um, that I refill or something that I can easily pour water. I don't think you need any sort of special product for that. Um, the last thing that I do think is very important, this is not something you need to buy, but it's something you just need to mentally prepare yourself for, is seed starting to have success and it, you just need to be very attentive. Um, because you're talking about little baby seedlings that can honestly just shrivel up and die with one day of getting too dry, I think the number one reason people fail at seed starting is just because they're negligent. And it's easy to be negligent because you are taking on the care of a living thing that you're not used to caring for, so it's easy to forget. So just already prepare yourself that you're gonna set alarms on your phone and you are going to make a dedicated time every day to check on your seedlings. Now you're probably gonna be excited. You might not even really need that. I mean, I, I plant my seedlings and I check on them 30 minutes later knowing that they're not sprouted at that point. But it, it can be hard at the beginning, especially if you're starting your seeds kind of maybe in a basement that you don't go to every day or you know, outside in a greenhouse that you don't necessarily go to every day. Uh, so set an alarm, make sure that they have access to enough light, um, which basically means if you're trying to start your seeds in a window and they start like leaning a whole lot, you're gonna be very diligent to turn those cups multiple times a day to make sure they're getting equal exposure to the light. Um, whatever it is that you do, you're gonna have to be attentive, but you can, you can totally do it. Seed starting is not hard, and if you have these basic things that I have listed to get started, that's enough. Now, later on, if your seeds are gonna be in pots for six to eight weeks, um, you're probably gonna need some sort of liquid fertilizer. I typically use um, an organic liquid fertilizer from Neptune's Harvest, which is really great. You just pour a little bit in water and feed it to your plants. That's because there's only so much nutrition and well, little pots worth of soil as that plant that get lar gets larger is gonna use it up. Um, but you don't actually need that to get started. That's, that's probably not even gonna be necessary until about four to six weeks after planting. Um, but yeah, that's really all you need is seeds, medium, pot to hold it, some sort of tray or something to keep that in if you don't want your water running everywhere. Light and heat, however it is that you end up providing that and something to help you remember to go take care of them and you should have success. I've killed many seedlings, that is true, but I have carried a lot more to maturity um, and it's something that I believe even the beginner gardener can do. It can save you a lot of money. It can make a world of options available to you. I think it adds a lot of excitement and spice to gardening. Um, I love starting seeds. I am counting down the days until seed starting. I know you guys are excited too. 
and I can't wait to share it with you. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.